So. So, it's your turn. Welcome to this virtual visit. Uh, we are live from the CMS control room uh, at the CERN LHC. It's uh, evening here. Um, I understand that it's not evening for everyone. So welcome you all from everywhere. Tonight, there will be two Andres with you. Uh, my name is Andres. I grew up in Puerto Rico and I've been a member of CMS for about 10 years now. And uh, yes, I'll just pass it on to you. And I'm Andre, I'm from Portugal and I've been in CMS Oh wow! <laughs> you start doing the math. It's been Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's been fifteen years now, so we've actually seen this detector through a lot. Yes. All right. So just uh, to recap, please put your questions on the Q and A, and so that everybody is aware, uh, this uh, session will be fully recorded and made available at uh, on YouTube uh, after the event is over. So we need approximately two hours to record this. Okay, we are told that it's not going to take two milliseconds. It will take two hours to get it off to YouTube um, because computers are not faster. Is that right, Sultan? Yeah, that's that's a problem. That's it's a problem. the stupid computer, computer. Computers are slow. Yeah. Yes. And maybe the FFM pack because it's at Yeah, it's all the slow. So it's uh, usually my fault. <laughs> Everything. <clears throat> okay, so the program is that we will take you on a virtual tour. And actually, I'm, I'm just going to sort of try and take advantage from the fact that it's quiet here. It's not at all how the detector uh, where we are going to take you is. It's definitely not quiet down there. Although technology for noise canceling nowadays is fantastic. Um, but just to tell you that it's, it's the kind of tour that normal visitors who physically come here cannot do. So when people come and visit the experiment, uh, we cannot take them to some of the places that we will be able to go uh, today. So um, I think I'll leave Andreas <laughs> to, to figure out the questions and I'll go get myself equipped. Sounds good. All right. You so, already have 11 questions. Yes, okay. that's okay. Andres that's is fully good. equipped and uh, yes. to, to... Well, I, I want to get a sense of, uh, you know, the previous background that people have. Um, and I think based on the questions we can sort of tell, I think most of you guys have at least uh, some idea of what the LHC is and what we do at CERN. Um, but maybe I can just do a two minute introduction and mm -hmm. then start mm -hmm. answering some of the Should questions. Should I share the first slide? Yeah, let's uh, do a very quick introduction. So as Andre mentioned, we are here in CMS. Um, and where we are right now is part of the LHC experiment. But uh, the LHC experiment is hosted by CERN, which is a international laboratory. And um, there are a lot of people involved in the work that happens at CERN. And it's it's very historical. It was founded in 1954, and it's been dedicated to fundamental science since. LHC is currently, let's say, the largest experiment, and it has very large collaborations. So the LHC is essentially an accelerator. Um, you can, you know, if you if you simplify it to the extreme. You can think of it as a very powerful microscope. What it allows us to do is to investigate what happens at the smallest scales. And what I mean is it allows us to describe the smallest scales, uh, you know, what are things made of and how they interact. That's sort of the questions we're after. So in order to do that, we take a lot of the, or many protons, what we call bunches of protons, and we accelerate them. Uh, there are multiple stages of acceleration, if you will. And we take just uh, protons from a hydrogen bottle and we start going through stages of acceleration until we inject them at the LH into the LHC tunnel. 
and there we have uh, you know protons going in one direction, protons going at the, in the other direction, essentially at the speed of light, and we uh, make them collide at four places in the OHC. So Sultan can kind of it, it, he's uh, mousing over CMS, Atlas, uh, LHCB, and Elise. So these are the main experiments. CMS and Atlas are sort of the general purpose detectors. LHCB and Elise are more uh, sort of, let's say, specific or, or specialized. So there's a lot of stuff, right? This is really just the very basics. Um, that was a question, sorry. Yeah. That was a question about why is it so deep? Why is it on the ground? Let me just yeah. search for. Uh, and then in the meantime, I'll show you right. this. So, I'll let you do it to this point. So you can see here, uh, and I, you know, this uh, tells us that the audience knows a little bit about the LHC already. So as you can see from this figure, um, most of the facilities or the LHC itself, the LHC tunnel, is underground and something that's interesting is in this figure it just looks you know um, it just looks perpendicular to the ground but that's not actually the case the LHC tunnel is slanted so it has a bit of an angle and it is deeper at some points uh, than other points so here in CMS we the facilities are about 100 meters underground in other locations it's even deeper like 150 but to answer the question, the, the main reason, there's several reasons uh, which are interesting, but one of the main reasons that we have to build the experiments so deep underground is that they are immense. And in the case of CMS, we have a, a very, very heavy detector. We're talking on the order of 14,000 tons, which if you, you know, it's 14,000 tons, that's about twice the weight of the Eiffel Tower. And you simply can't, build this on the surface in, in this region here because it would just sink. The soil is not uh, sturdy enough. It's sort of like there's water, there's actually running water under the soil here. So you really have to build this on the bedrock. And that's the main reason why we have to be, build these experiments underground. So uh, Andre, if you would also like to, you can interrupt whatever yep. you want, but if you want to show the control yep. room just one question, what is a solenoid? We have a sure. powerful magnet in there, just. So we, we have the, actually this particular picture is I think very useful. So to very quickly answer the question, a solenoid is a type of magnet. Um, and the solenoid name has to do with the shape of the magnet. But for our purposes, uh, the solenoid in CMS uh, corresponds to a superconducting magnet and it is cylindrical. It's about six meters in inner diameter. And a lot of the, what I would actually call the main parts of our detector are inside of this, of this magnet. Um, so we, will, we can talk a lot more about the solenoid, but maybe that's a good yeah, starting it's, point. It's basically just, it's basically a very big coil that makes mm -hmm. a very large magnetic just, field. Just like, I, uh, I'm not uh, sure if call. you might be muted. I can I but, can be heard there. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, I yeah actually <laughs> you are you are very close to each other, therefore you have a cross talk. Okay. <gasps> oh no. No, well, no, it, it, it is just it. a technical thing. <laughs> All right. So we can either we we can we can probably just start going around and then yeah. seeing what questions there are. Yes. So and, Actually, I, I stopped the share. You can you can look around in the control room because we also got a question about what the control room is for. We can like to... no, you can describe it. I, I will yeah. go okay. downstairs. So the control room where we are at this moment is the is the room where we control the experiment. It's it's very simple. The we have something like 120 million data channels the experiment, all of them requires power, some of them cooling, some of them gas, high voltage, etc. We have to, to set these from here. And also we have to milk these 120 million uh, data channels since we are taking data as well. So that's our, these are the two main purposes of the control room. And of course, there are some auxiliary things here as well 
probably we are going to talk about. Maybe we can switch to Andres' camera. So oh, yes, sorry. I, I just, just pulled up. Yeah, I, so, so the control room has two main uh, ah, are. areas. <laughs> the one down there is where we look at the data that the detector is producing, making sure that it makes sense uh, and that nothing is going wrong. And so sitting here on your left is tonight's shift leader. And uh, the shift leader is the point of contact between everything and CMS. If something is needed, he's called. He's the one who's keeping an overview of what's going on during an eight hour shift. And then here to our left is the technical shifter uh, domain. And you have everything that's related to power, cooling, um, gases, uh, fluids, and also the access system. So this is the, the system where we control the access of people and materials to the uh, caverns and other areas. So then another one thing that's rather, you know, this dark part over here, this has to do with uh, our control of the beams. In fact, uh, you will see that there are these two buttons and these two buttons are behind doors and then they are receded. And the reason is that with these buttons, you can actually dump the LHC beam. So if you find something that's not going right in CMS, you can throw away the beam. And so that's why it's, it's something which you cannot just uh, bump uh, yourself against uh, by mistake. And then this big synoptic panel behind here with all the green and red lights, this is an overview of the detector and the whole infrastructure. And you can see, for instance, down here, you can already see the structure of the CMS detector again. So there are these 11 slices, um, basically four, um, sorry, three uh, end cap disks and five barrel wheels surrounding the point where the interactions, the collisions take place. The other half of the control room is space dedicated to experts when they need to come and uh, do some work uh, on the different pieces of CMS. So it's Saturday night here and there's really no need to do anything. And in fact, you can see in that screen over there at the end, and this is actually available on the web, uh, the big gray triangle is how many, let's say, stuff that we pick up, data that we store. So there was a big, what we call a big run. There was a big run that started probably this morning. It was accumulating muons from cosmic muons. So these are particles, interactions that happen in the Earth's atmosphere. And then they go through our detector so we can see them. And they are really nice because they allow us to align the detector because the muon goes straight. It does not really care that much about the detector. So if we see a big kink, it's probably the detector that is misaligned. And so you can see here that recently, just probably a couple of hours ago, uh, we stopped this very big run and we started a new run. And so these muon runs uh, are something crucial that we do while the accelerator is not running. So, Andres, is there somewhere I should you would like me to go to, or should I continue down? Uh, I think you can go ahead and continue down. And okay, uh, there are many questions. Um, I think Sultan and I are sort of typing a few answers, but uh, we can also cover a few more questions. And there's one that I've seen a couple of times about why is the why is the LEC tunnel circular? And this can be an interesting question. Um, uh, we are working on the same question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. In this case, I, uh, it's it's probably better to to answer in in live. So I I just send a, an empty yeah, string. And, and perhaps both of us can answer it because there's there's several ways to answer it. One way to answer it is that it actually is not perfectly circular. There are many straight sections and there are bends, so it's actually not quite circular. But another way to talk about this is to contrast what we call circular accelerators or synchrotrons versus a linear accelerator, which is a different kind of machine. Uh, but Sultan, maybe you, talk, you can talk about what you were typing? So, uh, well, actually, uh, so this is a circular accelerator, 
because the particles go round and round, they are orbiting. This is needed because in this case, we can kick them every time they go through the accelerator part and we can reuse the particles. Uh, if you want to reach a very high uh, particle energy, you have to use this kind of accelerators. This, is, this was done in Fermilab. This is done here uh, for decades. Uh, but this is circular. But of course, this is not a circle. This is an octagon. It has eight straight lines and eight bands. If you need to bend the particle path, you need powerful magnets. We call them dipole magnets because they have one north and one south pole. And they, they can bend the particles. But for, for the experiments, we need straight on or straight sections in order to make head on collisions of the particles. This is absolutely needed that the particle coming from the left has the same energy and same momentum as the particle coming from the right. Uh, this is absolutely needed for, uh, for the experiment. And then uh, that's how it works. There are some linear accelerators in the, in, on the accelerator market as well. But you can imagine they have an input and an output. They, the particle comes in and goes out, and you have only one chance to, to accelerate them. Maybe the, the new accelerators that our, our colleagues are working on will be linear accelerators in 10 years, 20 years from now. But that's a different story and that's a different question. So <laughs> maybe I can cover at least Wait, two questions very quickly. Can I? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Be, uh, before the questions, before the questions. questions well. So we just, we, just, we just got the elevator. I don't know if you could see, there are basically only three. Uh, uh, well, we're not going to go inside because otherwise we lose the network. But there uh, are only three. You can go in. But don't close the we door. We can go in. Yeah. Okay. Right, so the door. there are basically only three stops. Uh, there's minus one, minus two, and minus three. But I don't know if you could see minus three is in. It's at 100. Well, 97 meters deep. So we in the elevator we only have three choices. Well, four choices if you look at the surface. Um, and uh, one thing before we lose the network, I just wanted to show you. Uh, this, this is a detailed planning of what happens around the detector in the different days. So you will see here, Saturday, there was work happening. And you see that the different slices have been opened up in order to actually figure out things that need to do. So we work Saturdays, and then we do not work Sundays, but then on Monday, there's going to be work over there for the electromagnetic calorimeter and there's going to be here for the resistive plate chambers, the connection, connecting the gas on a dummy chamber. So this way, everybody knows where the work is happening and how to synchronize uh, with each other. All right, and now uh, Noemi and I are going to go down and we'll see you on the other side. Okay, thank you. Okay, we are going to lose them, of course, in the, the elevator shaft. The, network goes down, but it's not so easy to say, because on the way down, we lose them, on the way up, we, we won't lose them. <laughs> so there was a question, I don't know if, uh, if you might have already answered it, but the, if I recall correctly, the velocity of the particles is something like 99.999991% the speed of light. So there's, I think, five nines in there? Seven. Seven nines, okay. Seven. It's basically the speed of light. It's, in fact, we don't talk about the velocity of the particles. We talk about their energy. That's what we're actually. Working. Actually, this is uh, this supports very much uh, Albert Einstein's special relativity. So, uh, if you accelerate a particle to to these energies, you rather make its energy or mass than than the velocity. So, when we accelerate a particle from the SPS, that's the previous pre-accelerator or the last pre-accelerator to the LHC, we accelerate it to 450 GeV, doesn't matter what it means. And then in the, the LHC, we accelerate the particles up to 70 EV, 
which is 15 times more energy, but the velocity changes by something like 10 kilometers per hour. We can switch to yes, I Andre. think we can give them back. So Andre, maybe we can pass it over to you and you can talk a bit about the service cavern. Okay, so we have just entered one of the service caverns and you see these corridors are full of cabinets and these cabinets, a good thing is that we are not visitors. So we can actually go in. Uh, these cabinets are full of electronics. So just to give you an idea, every yellow thing cable that, or blue bundle that you see here, these are not electrical cables. These are all optical fibers and they are going between this service cavern where we have all the electronics all the way to the other side to the detector. There are fibers going down, telling the detector what to do. And then there are fibers coming back, uh, telling us what data uh, the detector has uh, de measured. So we have basically two floors of electronics. And uh, I just want to bring you to one of my favorite places here in CMS, which it's the heart of CMS, which is right here. Um, I apologize for the lack of blood, but this is where, okay, so this requires a bit of explanation. The, the detector, Sorry, let me just get you a, a, a neat picture. The detector is basically always on doing a movie, like a low resolution movie of what happens in the collisions. And it, the frame rate is 40 million frames per second. So that movie comes back to this cavern. There are a lot of electronics for which we write the codes. I mean, we really have to figure out the algorithms and then that those algorithms have to select 100,000 pictures out of the 40 million a second movie for full processing. So it's here where that decision comes to a single point. And then once it's decided, oh yeah, this collision looks great. It's in this system here on the, on the left with all the beautiful yellow uh, fiber cables. That is the place where it's told to everything in CMS, look, this is the one of the 40 million that we want to take a high resolution picture of. And then once that information gets to the detector, we pick up the information and then we ship it back uh, into the experiment. And it goes upstairs to a farm of computers where there are like 20,000 computers or 20,000 cores that process the high resolution picture. Uh, and then out of those 100,000 high resolution pictures a second, we actually can only afford to save about five to 7,000 a second. So this is, you know, if the, if the data do not make, make it through this selection step, they are lost forever. And that's, you know, it's okay because most of the things that we happen here in, in the collisions for the most part, they are things we already know about. That's why the beams at the LHC have to be so intense. It's so that we can produce all the things that are very rare. So just to give you an idea, this is not just electronics and computers and optical fibers. Uh, this is actually an electrical cable and I'll just put my finger next to it for scale. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, power that is needed to feed uh, all of the electronics of the detector. And then this whole corridor is high voltage supplies. So gaseous detectors, solid state detectors, typically we have to put a high voltage so that then charged particles leave a signal. So I'll make my, uh, I'll make my way to the experimental cavern and uh, back to you, Andres. Okay, thanks so much. So I am hoping to actually uh, maybe a bit, uh, uh, let's say optimistically try to answer many questions at once. So 
there are several questions about what actually happens during these collisions. And I'd like to describe more or less what we see and, and along the process give you a sense of really how things look like, and not just that, also give you a sense of why we do this. So when we actually have these collisions, we're taking billions of protons and making them uh, pass by billions of protons. And what we really do is we take these, what we call beams of protons, these bunches of protons, and we squeeze them down to about the width of a human hair. And when that happens, when they come together, these bunches, uh, there's, let's say on the order of 50 of these particles that actually interact. And by interact, I mean they might scatter, but often much more exciting things happen. So they interact violently, right? And we can actually create, uh, we can actually see interactions that we normally would not see. So that's really what we're interested in. We're looking at these interactions and we're trying to reconstruct what really happens. We can only see the aftermath of the interactions. And then we sort of use all the hints, all the, all the things that are left in our detector, all the signals and the signatures, and we try to reconstruct what happened. And ultimately what we wanna do is create, we, we have these equations, this model, this very detailed description that allows us to predict what might happen during one of these interactions. And we just want to go in, take many of these samples, right? As Andre was saying, we're sort of taking a video. It's like a video camera taking samples, um, taking images. And we want to compare our prediction to what our observation. Mm -hmm. And that way we can learn a bit about the smallest uh, it, fundamental components of the universe. We, we have this description that says, well, we have you know, quarks and leptons, you know, these things like electrons. And this description, this model tells us how they interact, how they talk to each other. So we put that kind of model to the test all the time. In fact, what makes a lot of us excited is to see if we can find problems with this model, right? If we can improve it uh, or replace it completely. So that's really our goal. And that's how we use these collisions, these interactions. Uh, now, now that you have a sense of what this sort of thing is, uh, this sort of collider is doing, you might imagine that it's not, uh, you know, I see some questions about precautions, precautions against meltdowns, for example. So it's not really like that. It's not like a nuclear uh, plant or anything like that. These are very, very small fundamental interactions. So we don't really need to be concerned about anything like that. Um, so, Andres, I'm sorry, I, I saw a question about what's, what's with the radiation doors. So these, yeah, are the kinds, just, yeah. these are the kinds of signs that we have so that humans know what's going on. So behind, behind this door, there's something that we call a, the gas room. And we have a lot of detectors that need to have a gas medium to produce a signal of the passage of the particles. The best, easiest way of turning on all the channels in those detectors is to just basically sprinkle some radioactive powder or radioactive gas. And then the decay of those radioactive particles actually will turn on all of the detectors uh, that use that technology. So this is very important because we have tens of thousands of wires in these wire chambers. So that's the gas detectors. They have wires running through them. And basically uh, we need to know which wires are actually live and which ones might need to be repaired, which ones might be flaky and so on and so forth. So that's the main reason why there is a radiation sign here. It has nothing to do with the collisions. Actually, it's basically- actually this this is to measure the so-called drift velocity. I, I know about this source and know about this device. I was close when it was developed. I didn't participate, but um, there is a, so uh, these gas detectors are slow. Slow means uh, a, a fraction of a millisecond. <laughs> but of course we need to know how long it takes to drift the electron that is uh, that that is 
deliberated by the ionization of the particle pass through, and how long does it take to go to the uh, uh, cathode wires or anode wires? And this uh, can tell. Uh, this this velocity depends very much on the pressure, the humidity content, the the, the gas composition, etc. Uh, it is much easier to measure it than to calculate. And this little device can can calculate it for the mirror system. Uh, it definitely needs to have a radioactive source. This is a very weak source anyway. Um, and then that's why we had to put this panel on. So okay. I, actually, so there, is a, there is a little map on the bottom that shows where this radioactive source is. So there was a question about what is a gas detector? Um, the, the detector, the, the, the main point is that when, for instance, a charge, a particle with electrical charge goes around like a muon. So a muon is like a heavy electron. When it moves, the fact that it has an electric charge, we put it to our benefit. We put it to that to work. So we make gas mixtures that are very easy producing electrons when these charged particles go through. And what Zoltan was talking about the drift is that when you produce these electrons, this, the electrons from the gas, they go to the wire. And that takes, you know, that movement, that's the drifting movement. And then we collect the charge. And then we know that there was a muon going through this particular point. So, so I, let me just show a picture. I, I just, just webbed it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, All right, and then the, so while, while I'm still while you're looking for the picture, this sign over here, uh, yeah, okay, so that's the drifting. You can see the, the the tilted line is let's say the muon going through, and uh, then you have this these purple and green lines, which is how the uh, electrons from the gas will you know their path towards the wire. So those dots, those are wires. It's, we are seeing this as a cut through uh, the detector. Now, the fact that we use lots of gases and that we are 100 meters underground, thanks, Sultan. Yep. So this sign here has been described by many visitors as what happens to physicists when they don't drink enough coffee. Uh, in fact, it's what happens to all humans when they are deprived of oxygen. And uh, this is a oxygen deficiency hazard alarm. So we are underground in these tunnels. And if there is a release of liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, those will suddenly, well, will very quickly go become gases and they will take up the space of the air that we can breathe. So if this thing goes off, we are out of here. Now, this brings me to uh, the last thing I wanted to show you here. So in front of, in front of us, if I can hit the right camera swift, uh, there we go. This door is the last place people can be when there are collisions. So if there are collisions happening and somebody breaks through this door, the beam is sent to the beam dump, which is basically the trash bin for the beams or where beams go to rest. Uh, and so we are going to go through this door. I mean, you saw upstairs, just to let you, to give you an idea, you see this machine over here, this will actually scan my eye and verify that, oh, it's Andre that's going in. Can he go in? Yeah, we think so, fine. So he, he goes in. The other thing which is you know, sort of weird about this door and actually it's a problem for newcomers is that it opens on your face. And uh, while that might sound a bit weird, yeah, that's why we put on the floor this region, you, know, you should stay out of this when you're going in. It's uh, because if there is some sort of emergency, you need to go out, you just keep pushing as you go out. And so there's a lot of thinking here about how to keep humans safe. So Noemi, if you can hold it, I'll go through. So I have to take my dosimeter. So this is a personal device that uh, registers uh, my exposure to radiation, which has been, I'm sorry, not a lot. And then I ask it, can I please go in? And then it will, open the door, I'll go in quickly because there's a lot of sensors measuring my weight and volumetric sensors in here to make sure, there we go. And now I check my retina. So we can only go in one person at a time and it's guaranteed that there's only one person inside. 
And so Noemi will now go in and you can see exactly how this happens. So oh. the door is going to open. There we go. And yes, back to you, we'll, we'll mute when we can. Okay, so I just wanted to take a quick second. We're about to go check out the experiment itself, the detector, but there are many, many questions about the Higgs. Um, so I would like to very quickly in like 20 seconds, try to tell you about the Higgs. So there's no gut particle. It's called the Higgs boson. That's what it is. Uh, and it was Higgs... supposed to be the goddamned particle, but then they said, no, 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 it cannot be that the book cover cannot have that. That's... Yeah, exactly. I didn't want to use this phrase in front of children. Uh, <laughs> but this was a misunderstanding indeed. Yes, it's, we can blame it on Leon Letterman. But in any case, the Higgs is a manifestation of what we call the Higgs field. And what the Higgs field is, is very complicated, but you'll hear things that like uh, the Higgs field is responsible for giving elementary particles their mass. Let's leave it at that because it's very quick and simple, but of course there's more detail behind that. And the way we discovered the Higgs was actually doing exactly what I mentioned earlier. We have a prediction and we have an observation and we compare them. And you, we can actually make a prediction where the Higgs doesn't exist. And we look at our, our observations and when we collect enough data, we can see that they don't agree. And in fact, the data is suggesting, it, it agrees more with the hypothesis, with the model that says the Higgs is there and has these properties than it does with the hypothesis or the model that says that there is no Higgs. So hopefully that's brief enough. Uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Andre. Yeah, let me just show you uh, an so, event that we think. Very quickly, is, Sultan, do you want to? So actually, actually, this is a Higgs candidate. Yes. By looking at this, what you see here is, the, <clears throat> is one of the photos that we take. Uh, and, and this is already evaluated. So we reconstructed the path of the, the muons, the, uh, the photons, because this, is, this seems to be two photon and two muon event, and, and also some other uh, uh, tracks of particles. Um, we don't visualize all the 40 million events per, per second. We visualize only those couple of images or couple of, as we call, events. That are, that are interesting. This, this event survived all the criteria we created for the Higgs selection. So we, we, we think that this might be a Higgs event. Uh, by looking at this, you cannot tell it at 100% because there are other uh, physics uh, processes that might create the same uh, 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 picture. But this, this is what we can say that this survived. Um, so what is to... very important, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. one more thing, that we have to confess that there were Nobel Prizes awarded for discovery of Zs, Ws, and the Higgs lately. Uh, but uh, these particles are very short-lived ones. No one can see them directly. So they, will, they are not on the picture, yeah. only only those particles are in the picture that are the decay of the, of the Higgs. They emerge by the decay of the Higgs. And analyzing the decays, decay events, we can have uh, uh, statistical analysis on the, on the Higgs. This is a very complicated right. thing. So this is not this is not a drawing. I mean, uh, the, the, picture, the picture that Tolkien was showing, it's not a drawing or something that uh, we drew by hand. It's a representation of what was measured in the detector. So behind me are uh, one of uh, the end cap um, uh, disks with uh, the muon chamber. So these are cathode strip chambers. And you will see that they are staggered. So there's like one in front, one behind, one in front and so on and so forth. And this is because we have to put them really such that there are no holes, no gaps. You try to keep all of the active volume so that we can see everything going through. Because one of the most interesting particles that we produce here are neutrinos. And neutrinos are small, neutral, and they just go through matter and leave basically no signal or very, very little signal, very rarely. 
So we basically only want, we only know if there was a neutrino produced, if we are able to measure everything around the collision point and see that there is, for instance, energy missing, or there's some sort of energy imbalance. All right, so down there, there is also, you see this, uh, this line over here, this is the beam pipe. So this is where the LHC beam circulates and then it collides towards the center of the experiment in that direction. And uh, we are going to go down to the ground of the experiment, to the floor of the experiment to show you how tall and how big all of this is. And to do that, we have to go where no visitors have gone before. Back to you in the control room. Okay. Um, so let me see if there are a few more questions that we can look at. Uh, so I was just answering a question about the SPS and we already talked a bit about it. So I'll just add that the super proton synchrotron, the SPS was, uh, well, still is one of the pre uh, stages of the LHC, but back in the day in the 70s and 80s, it was the most powerful accelerator of its time. So there's been many accelerators throughout history. Uh, the LHC, LHC just happens to be the most powerful accelerator in the world right now, but there are many others right now. They're just different. They do, uh, they're used for different things. But the SPS in particular um, is very historical. In fact, Sultan started to talk about this. It, it actually uh, involved or, or it actually was used to discover the vector bosons, which are these very interesting particles that have to do with what we call the weak interaction. And uh, some people won the Nobel Prize for those discoveries. Andrea, you want to take over? Um, sure. I, I, just, I just arrived here at the floor of the cavern. And I am under the pit. So there is a, 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 a whole pit that was excavated. So this is 100 meters deep. And all parts of CMS have been uh, lowered through here. Now, the SPS, uh, it was already super because it was much bigger than the one of the first machines that CERN, which was the PS, the proton synchrotron. And in fact, uh, if you think about the accelerators at CERN, uh, they are connected to each other. And the LHC is like the fifth gear uh, in, uh, in a gearbox. So if you have a manual shift car, uh, you know, stick shift, you have to change gears. And as you change gears, you go faster. And what happens here at CERN is similar. So we have one accelerator that goes from like zero <laughs> to 100 meters per second. And then each accelerator picks up and it's like a relay race, picks up the beam and accelerates it to a higher energy. Now, one thing which is usually, or it's you know, not very commonly advertised, or it's not very clear is that there are more experiments at CERN than those at the LHC. So all of these accelerators have their own experimental program. They have their own set of experiments. And the LHC is just one thing that gets the beam like for two hours a day, fill it up, and then it just goes on its own merry way colliding whereas the beams continue pulsating and uh, through the other accelerators at CERN. So we're just proceeding through, let's see, here in the ground, in the floor of the cavern, uh, Peter Higgs was here and the Higgs boson was discovered because of collisions that happened here. Um, I think that uh, we discovered Peter Higgs before we discovered the Higgs boson. I think Peter Higgs was here in 2008. I'm not so sure. And then it was in 2012 that we had enough data to actually uh, say that uh, we had found this new particle. And uh, just uh, behind me, let's see if I can uh, show you. So I've just, we've just walked to the other side of the experiment and you can see this big chunk, which is uh, silver, this is a nose. Uh, well, we call it the nose. It's the end cap nose that goes inside the experiment. So in fact, if we move just here, 
you can see a lot of the layers. So you can see down here, or sorry, up here, there are several layers. These correspond to different uh, detectors that we have. And we have different detectors because they each specialize on different types of interactions. And that's how we distinguish which particles were produced in the collisions. Yeah, so maybe we can quickly show the slice uh, because there is a question about yes. how the different parts of the detector let work and just, react. Let how me we just act. first, uh, yeah, this slice you want. Yeah. So, uh, Andrea, would you like to describe the slice or should I? I think he's. Go for it. Okay, so, so very quickly, I, I will try to. Uh, add to what Andrea was saying. So, uh, you know, we have these layers of detectors, right? And very quickly, the way I would describe the detector itself is that the innermost layer uh, is based on silicon detectors. And we use those to try to reconstruct the trajectory of charged particles. And after that, we, had a, we have a calorimeter. We have two different types of calorimeter. And those allow us to determine the energy of the particles. And these could be um, electromagnetic particles. That means photons or electrons. Uh, and it can tell us also about what we call hadrons. So these are particles made of quarks and gluons. Um, so at that point, we have a lot of information. And after that layer, we have the superconducting solenoid, which we started to talk about. So this is a very important part of our detector. Uh, we mentioned that, you know, it's very large, it's like a cylinder, but it actually generates about 3.8 Tesla when you cool it down to about 4 Kelvin and you pump about 18,000 amperes of current through it. And that, in, that immense magnetic field allows us to determine some of the properties of the particles. So charged particles will bend under a magnetic field. And the amount of bending is that it can tell us something about the energy. A particle that travels, a charged particle that travels very quickly will have a more straight trajectory than one that has a very low energy. So after the superconducting solenoid, we have uh, the muon system. And the muon system is a gaseous detector. And it's dedicated to measuring muons, which are particles like the electron, but a lot heavier. And since they're heavier, it requires a large magnetic field to make them, uh, a very strong magnetic field to make them bend. So in the outer layers of our detector, we still generate about two Tesla. In order to accomplish that, we need a lot of steel in this, well, as we call it, the return yoke. And that's the red sections there. There's so much steel, in fact, that that accounts for 12,500 out of the 14,000 tons of the detector. So the outer layers, this muon system is very, very heavy. And this, uh, there's different muon systems, but they're all gaseous detectors, which Andre was describing earlier. Uh, so anything else here or, or back to you, Andre? Yeah, so I just wanted to point mm -hmm. out that the red that you see is the exact same red that we have here on the picture. So there you have the center of the experiment is down there. So this circle over here, is actually the magnet, uh, it's over there, it's this circle. And then you can see this red part, these different red slices. Those are, you know, as Andres was saying, this is where the magnetic field returns because the magnetic field looks a bit like an apple. So it goes in in the middle and then it has to go around and it comes back through the red uh, material and then it goes in back uh, uh, through, the, through the center of the solenoid. And, what the other thing you can see here is that on the side of each one of these, so this is a wheel, you have the muon detectors interspersed between the return yoke. So this is where we have all those gaseous detectors that we were talking about earlier, uh, the drift tubes. And then there's a lot of electronics that are housed uh, directly with the, uh, the wheel. So these wheels move we can move them and all of the electronics and all of the pipes have to move with them. So that's uh, something that makes it uh, rather complex uh, to, to build these detectors. The other thing I wanted to point out is you see these squares over here. So these have corresponding elements on the other side. It's those octagons over there. So there are these octagons over here. 
And this, these are in place because when we close the detector, it actually closes with a lot of force. So these are basically stoppers so that we don't crush all of the detectors against each other. And as far as I understand, after closing the detector, uh, because of the intensity of the magnetic field, the detector shrinks uh, still a bit. So it's like 15 meters, sorry, 20 meters long, and it will shrink. I think it's about one centimeter, but it shrinks after we close it. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is, you see this black sort of spider here? This is a very, very precise alignment system. So all these tubes have lasers going through them so that we can measure very precisely the deformation of these structures. And now we are going back to the other side because uh, uh, the sorry, magnetic, Andrea. yeah. Hi, two What's things. Uh, Zoltan, I have some messages for you. Could you please read them? And second, Andre, Nicole yeah, Horton it, wants it, to know what are those blue wires? Yeah. Oh, uh, which like, ones you mean, Delia? It was Nicole Horton's question. We what have about six wires? questions. A minute, two minutes ago. Yeah, I I don't know I don't know which wires are what but there are many wires here that bring up power. Others bring optical fibers, others bring high voltages, others bring low voltages. Well, wait, this one, yeah, red is high voltage, low voltage. and blue is low voltage for the muons. It's a good thing we have experts here because I work in the calorimeters, but Noemi works on the muons and Zoltan was also telling us about the drift tubes. It's fantastic that we have everyone. Uh, <laughs> there are also, but I mean, it's actually, in a, in a way, it's, it's amazing that all of these things actually connect somewhere and things work because there are hundreds of thousands of kilometers of cables down here and fibers and tubes and pipes and uh, all of that. So oh, they Andre? basically connect. Yes. Uh, I just, uh, I saw one question that I really liked and maybe you can, it, it well, it actually connects to a, a few other questions. So. The question was, how long did it take to build a CMS detector, which is can be a very elaborate question, but it can also oh. sort of hint at the, at the <laughs> upgrades and what we're working on now and, and you know. Okay, so this detector is always being built in a way because whenever we can, you see right now we opened it up. It was closed just a couple of weeks ago and we opened it up because we want to probably fix something. I don't know exactly what. And as Andres was saying, there are upgrades that will need to be done so that the detector works until 2040. And the detectors started working in 2008. And but so the you... detectors were, you know, and, but that's what already, things were already installed. The detectors started being built around 2004. So it's uh, something which uh, really takes a long time because we have to develop the technologies. I, we cannot just go down to the target store or you know the supermarket and buy these detectors. And that's also the reason why a lot of uh, detector technologies are used in medical applications. In particular, you know things like X-rays, tomographies, uh, positron scans, scintigraphies. All of those techniques use interactions of particles with matter to figure out what's going on inside the humans. Well, and oh. other living things. And there, maybe uh, as an example, we can use how long it took to finalize, to, to grow the crystals for the electromagnetic calorimeter. Do you know, I think you probably know the answer. Well, the crystals, uh, there was an idea, I think it was in 1995. And then it took about seven years to figure out how to bake them properly. So we had the recipe. Uh, these crystals have lead and tungsten, so they are very heavy, but they are brilliant, sharp, transparent. So you can get all the signals. So it took about seven years to figure out the, the recipe. And then they were produced in Russia and in China. Uh, and then they were installed uh, in the detector that we have now. Unfortunately, some of those crystals, which are actually just up there uh, in, uh, two or three years, they are not going to be transparent and bright 
they are going to be rather milky and opaque. And so we will have to remove them because they will not transmit the light anymore. And in fact, all of this piece that you see here, we are going to chop it off and put in a new one that will have to work between 2027 and 2040. So that so it, sounds like a long- all of you, Yeah, exactly. For all of you who are listening, please take a moment and think what, what age you will have by 2040, because this detector will still be here. Yeah, and maybe that sounds like a long time in the future, but this project is actually what Andreas spends a lot of his time working on nowadays. So we have a lot of people that are looking towards the future and developing future technologies. So that's a lot of what we work on as well, not just the current detector that we have, but the future upgrades. So there's many fascinating parts of the detector. Maybe I can, I mean, I love the electromagnetic calorimeter and Andre was describing the process of how to make these crystals, but they're fascinating. There are, they are basically made of mostly lead and you add a bit of tungsten very carefully, of course, but you have almost like a solid metal. It's a very heavy object and it's transparent as Andre was saying, but when a particle, an energetic particle hits it, it produces light. And that's very interesting to me that we have these parts of the detector. And in, in case it wasn't clear, these things are made in the lab, right? You don't just go to a mine and pick them up. You have to create them. So this is why it took so long to figure out how to make them and to actually you know, go through and produce about 75,000 of these. Yeah, so each crystal actually weighs three kilos. So there's, there's, there are many tons of crystals in there. Now. Coming back to something that we were talking about before, the solenoid field. So the field that the CMS coil produces is about 100,000 times stronger than uh, the Earth's magnetic field. And that means that, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the experiment where you put a small needle and then with the magnet, at some point the needle gets magnetized and it will orient itself with the Earth's magnetic field. So these big metallic, you know, iron structures that we have in CMS, uh, because they are exposed to the, to the magnetic field for so long, they will also actually keep a magnetic field. So you do not need these uh, clips. They will just stick and they will not fall. So this is how strong the CMS magnet is. And right now it is off and we still feel the effects that it had on this steel uh, so that uh, it stays magnetic. All right, Andres, what else is on the, on the questions menu? Okay, so Sultan, I, I wanna make sure I'm not stepping on your toes. Is that, have you seen any questions that you... Thank you. Actually, I'm just answering a question about the crystals. Uh, the question was whether the crystals can be seen. I, I answered, unfortunately, no, they no. are very deep. But if we ask kindly Andre on the way back, on his way back yes. to, to make a tour to the uh, exhibition room, we have a, an exhibition crystal there. Hmm. Good. Uh, so there's a good question about the temperature. Does the temperature of our affect the experiment? And ECAL is very sensitive. So maybe, Andre, you can... Yeah, the well, temperature. that's a really good question. So one of the things that uh, many people think is the reason why we do these experiments underground is that those of you who have basements will know that they are pretty cool during summer and uh, rather warm during winter. Now... It is an advantage to be down here. The temperature is reasonably constant all year long. But for instance, the detector with the crystals, if you change the temperature by 0.1 degrees centigrade, you get a different amount of light for the same energy of particles. So you really have to keep the temperature very, very stable and very constant, well, very constant and very stable and measure it in case it changes, you need to correct for that. In fact, it's this, the, the crystal detector, we have to sort of calibrate it every 15 minutes because of the changes in the transparency of the crystals and the temperature ends up being one such factor. 
So we have like three different laser types that we shoot at the crystals to see exactly how they are responding to different types of light. So, and you do it how many, how often? Yeah, so every 15 minutes we go through all the crystals, all exactly. 75,000 seven of them. Exactly. 75,000. Yeah. So uh, maybe just to highlight this point, in order to maintain such a constant temperature for the crystal detector, it's very specific. And, you know, it's, it has to be at 20 degrees centigrade, and you can't change that by more than a fraction of a centigrade. Uh, so the rest of the detectors ha also has very specific conditions. And if you mm. imagine you start from the center of the detector, you have the silicon sensors, and these have to be kept at around minus 20 degrees centigrade. And that's required. This has to do with the lifetime of the silicon sensors. And after that, you have directly adjacent, like very close to these silicon sensors, you have the calorimeters. And these, you know, the crystal calorimeter has to be very specifically at, at 20 degrees, but it's also very close. If you keep moving your, uh, you know, radially outwards, you get to the superconducting solenoid, which is at around four Kelvin. <laughs> so you have to keep things really insulated, even though they're very close to each other. And you can get a sense of what, why we call this the compact muon solenoid. It looks massive, but uh, it's actually, everything is very, very close together inside of the experiment. Yeah, it's very dense. So engineering wise, this is very challenging just to deal with the temperature. So that means you have to have active cooling for the innermost part of the detector and has to be a separate system from for the electromagnetic calorimeter. And of course, very different from the cryogenic system for the magnet. So that gives you a sense of the engineering that's also involved. It's not just physics here. There's many engineering challenges that are very, very interesting. Um, that is a question. Con Wait, wait a second, Zoltan. Well, Zoltan, wait a second. So before, because I was thinking of just going up so I can show you the pieces of the detector that you have upstairs. I just wanted to point out the beam. So this is the beam pipe up here. So the beam pipe is, it's a, it's a place where the vacuum is better than outer space. So you may think, oh, in outer space, there's basically nothing. You know, you're wrong. There's lots of hydrogen atoms that are going around here, the vacuum is really, really, really good. And the last step in the vacuum is basically the coating of the pipe, uh, the pipe's interior that picks up it, it you know, it, it sort of, it's like uh, sticky, it's like sticky tape. And it basically, any molecules will get stuck to it. And the way to clean it is to literally put some hot blankets on top and uh, that will release all of the, uh, impurities or whatever is there while you're pumping out, but you have to bake it literally to 450 degrees centigrade that releases everything and then you cool it down and then this, like the sticky tape is stickier again. And uh, this, this whole line of uh, the beam is kept in vacuum for most of the time. So, but not All right, so right. This is what I wanted to, okay. yeah, this is what I wanted to point out. If you have such a vacuum, this is uh, dangerous in the sense that if you hit the, the tube, if you damage the tube, uh, this is not very good. And also the mid part of the tube is made of pure beryllium that is very, very fragile. So in these cases, when we move the detector parts, when we work around the, the beam pipe, the beam pipe is brought back to, to uh, atmospheric pressure, but of course we don't put a normal air in it because the normal air is extremely dirty in the sense uh, pure argon is vented into the tube. So maybe we can very quickly bring up, so somebody asked how wide the pipe is, and I believe it's about four centimeters or so. In the middle, but the as middle. you can see, if we go back with the camera, yeah, here there, there, are, there, are, there, is, there is also a part that is something like 10 centimeter in diameter. It depends where you, you measure it. The pipe is not a single pipe. But to very quickly add, you know, we're just discussing that this is a brand new beam pipe and it was just installed a few months ago. And actually the main reason for switching the, or, or, or one of the reasons for replacing the beam pipe is that in a few years where, you know, we describe these upgrades that are gonna happen in five or, or so years from now, the next generation silicon detector, silicon tracker, as we call it, 
is going to be so close to the interactions that we need a smaller diameter beam pipe in order to accommodate that. And these changes are happening now in anticipation for these kind of upgrades. Exactly. Exactly. These beam pipes, these beryllium pipes are expensive. I haven't seen the extremely expensive. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was just taking a selfie and I was commenting. I had never seen the beam pipe like this. It's amazing because we can see the place where it goes from being, I think, a normal beam pipe and it becomes our special beryllium material. So beryllium no, no, this is, is this is not no. beryllium there. This is just aluminium that you see. Uh, okay. The beryllium part is, is, is very well in the tracker only. Yeah, that's only okay. three meters long, not more than that. Uh, we couldn't afford uh, a full beryllium, but actually this disconnects to one of the questions that I always that I wanted to to speak out. How can a particle pa pass through so many layers of detectors without the behavior of particle being affected? A this is a very question. very good question. Yes. This is a very important part and one of the the biggest uh, uh, problems for a detector building. Uh, if you want to measure, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I was just saying goodbye to that. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so if you want to measure the particles in ERGI, you don't want to have it interacted with anything else before you do the measurement. Well, if you want to look at the trajectories, mm -hmm. you want it to be to, to be unaffected. You must exactly, get, exactly, exactly. So, so this is a very important thing. In order to build a detector, we have to make uh, extensive work on simulations. We already have a very good software. Uh, so, so when I said we want to reconstruct, you know, predict these interactions, we also have to predict how the, the how the particles that are produced interact with the material, exactly. and that has to be simulated. That's exactly. This is part actually. Uh, you cannot avoid hundred percent the interaction, but you can estimate how much it will affect your measurement. And this is why the simulation is, is so much important. Uh, the, the simulator software, let's, let's, let's uh, call it on its name. It's called Giant. Uh, this is a very complicated device, uh, software. This knows uh, the physics of how particles interact with matter. And you can simulate how the particles uh, 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 will interact with your detector. This is used not only in estimation, how the, what is the, the resolution or the, the uh, error of, the, of these measurements, but also we do this to estimate what the physics process will look like in the detector. This is also a very important part of our work. So there's many good questions. Um, so the one uh, first I... of all, let me say that we are really uh, really apologizing that, that we cannot answer all of them. We are yeah. typing here with Andres, uh, yeah, but, but, but we get this, more questions than yeah, these are we can answer. Very good questions. So one of them that I uh, that I like is asking how wide CMS is and why is it that wide? And to me, this uh, you know we can talk about again what really determines the size of CMS is the magnet. So. Uh, roughly speaking, CMS is about 15 meters tall. So that's the circumference of the detector itself. And the reason that it can be that particular dimension is because we have this very strong magnetic field, very relatively uniform magnetic field. So when you compare it to another experiment, another detector such as ATLAS, ATLAS has a different philosophy. They have a smaller, uh, you know, the, their magnetic field is only two Tesla, and it's a bit less uniform. Uh, so that means that if you want to determine the, the energy of these particles uh, based on how much they bend, you need to let them fly, if you will. So you need to, you need to have a larger space. So generally speaking, um, or roughly speaking, I guess, uh, Atlas has a magnetic field that's about half as much as it's uh, in, the, in the CMS magnetic uh, system, but it's about twice the size. And it also happens to be about half as heavy. So it's uh, very close to the same weight as the Eiffel Tower, whereas CMS is about twice that amount. And part of this goes, again, the dimensions, the, the weight, this is all related to the magnetic field. 
Andre, anything from you? I don't know if we have. Yeah, so sorry, I, I'm back. We, we were just switching networks again back to the Wi Fi. Um, the, whole, the whole notion, I mean, I'm sorry, go, going back to the notion of the layers uh, and the size, and Andres really hit the nail in the head. It really has to do with the intensity of the magnetic field. And it's, it's one of those incredibly fundamental differences between Atlas and CMS. So the two detectors, the two collaborations have very similar uh, goals uh, and they look for similar things, but they measure them in very, very different ways. Yeah, so maybe uh, there's a few questions about the relationship between the experiments or the collaborations. Ooh. Maybe we can say another word about that. Would you like to take that? Uh, that question? Yes, yes, because I discovered the word because of that. And the word is co-opetition. And this actually exists. You know, you know how you use a USB plug? That is because many different companies came together and decided, let's make the same standard. And even if they have competing products, they cooperated to have a single standard. Atlas and CMS have a similar relationship. It's like, of course, CMS is better, obviously. Uh, no, 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 no. We some... never say this. We never say this. We, we, we yeah, like no, very much I, our Atlas friends. I, have, I haven't finished. So what happens is that <laughs> the people are different. The detector technologies are different. Uh, so they have slightly different capabilities. They have slightly different interests. But if one of them finds something really incredible, like we had the, the, a Higgs boson, then the other one has to confirm it. If the other one does not confirm it, it's going to be a problem. It's like if you go to a doctor and they tell you you have a, you know, some really big problem or something that doesn't make sense, what do you do? You go to get a second opinion. So it's very important in our field to have independently, independent second opinions. And for instance, right now, there are some interesting results in neutrino physics because there was an experiment that ran be between the 90s and the early 2000s that had a certain result. And two experiments have been done recently to check if the result holds water. And up to now, it's unclear. Uh, it does not look like the first result uh, holds. So Atlas and CMS are very closely linked by the fact that they are both trying to understand what nature is made of at these particular uh, energy scales. Okay. All right, thanks, Andre. All right, so I'm just going through some of these questions as well. So I saw, I, I know people are curious about the Higgs, but I saw two questions. Uh, there's one about why the Higgs was important. I think there was a question about how do you, how do you communicate this to a very young child, the importance of the Higgs. Uh, Andre, do you want to say a word or should I? Okay, let me, let me, let me try. So you know how electrons go around in the atoms? I mean, it's, it's because they have mass. If electrons would not have mass, they would just you know, fly around like photons. Now, I'm sorry, you said a very young child. The, the point is that the, this Higgs boson that we found, uh, it is responsible for the fact that massive particles, massive elementary particles have mass. And uh, that is a very, strange, peculiar kind of uh, property of matter. I mean, we are all very familiar with it. You know, I gain weight every Christmas. Uh, so we are all very familiar with the notion of mass. You know, uh, Newton dropped an apple and it fell. The thing is that particles are different. And, you know, particles have like charge. It's either positive or negative. It's not like a continuous number. It's not like there's no such thing as a particle with a charge of pi or pi over two or 1.53 units. So mass 
on the other hand, the masses of particles, they have seemingly arbitrary numbers, arbitrary values. And it's the Higgs boson that sort of uh, is the, the, the clincher of all of these things of elementary particles having mass. Now, I just have to have a caveat, a caveat for those of you who, who know about, for instance, the mass of the proton, because that's the biggest, it's a huge chunk of the mass of, that we have in the universe uh, that's visible. Uh, the mass of the proton is not most, most, it's not coming from the Higgs boson. The mass of the proton has to do with another force, which is the strong force that makes all those quarks inside the proton go around. That's what makes up the mass of the, the proton. But if those quarks would have zero mass, they would not be going around. They would just be all over the place. So, Andres. Yeah, what, what I would add, I think especially if we're uh, talking to younger people, is that to me, the importance of not just the Higgs, but the research that we do, uh, the, what it means to me is exploration. And it's important because we are curious as a species of, you know, what's around us, what are things made of? We want to describe this. We want to try to see if we can understand the universe a bit better. Uh, so that is, that's all that's important to me, right? It's very significant, uh, I guess, when you put, when you think about it that way, we're really trying to describe the universe in the best way that we can. And this is how we push forward our understanding is with these kinds of, uh, this kinds of, uh, this kind of research, let's say. So Andre, back to you. Yeah, so we came here, we have an exhibition room and I, I just wanted to show you two things. So this is what uh, the crystals look like. And you see they are nice and uh, transparent and you know, without any glare. And one of these is a piece of plastic. So this is a piece of plastic and you can lift it, you can lift it very easily. This crystal is actually much harder uh, to lever down. So that, as, as, as transparent as it looks, it's mostly made of metal. It's basically lead, tungsten, and oxygen. So it's a lead tungstate uh, lattice. And these were grown from, uh, you know, in big, um, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, we have it just there. Okay. Ah, right. So they are grown in these crystals, uh, these ingots. And then they have to be cut. And in particular, the crystals are so, um, they were so good, they were so perfect that you had to have one of the, the sides. So one of the faces had to be depolished so that the light would not just go around forever and would actually hit uh, because you, you put like a piece of electronics at the end of each crystal. Uh, and you collect, you basically collect the light through that piece of electronics. And if you would just have all the sides of the crystal completely perfectly polished, the light would just go around like a billiard ball without never hitting the pocket. So you introduce this uh, roughness on one of the sides so that then the light can more easily uh, go all the way to the photo detector. So this is a piece of electronics that detects the photons and then produces an electric signal. The other thing we were talking about was these gaseous uh, detectors. So this is, you know, it's actually a super layer uh, where there are several drift tubes and you can see, uh, I hope you can see the red wire. Yeah, exactly, there in the middle. So there's a red wire in there. And then if you look at the cross section, you have basically this volume. And when a particle goes through, like for instance, this muon over here, it will produce an electrical charge, an electric charge that is collected by the wire. And what is really cool is that we have this long wire and we measure, basically if the particle goes through here, we measure the signal at both ends. And since the signal propagates in the wire at the same speed, we will see the signal, for instance, if the particle goes through here, it will arrive earlier here. So if we take the difference in time, we know where along the wire the particle went through. And uh, I've always found that to be a very neat trick uh, that uh, you know, we have to use because these are very big detectors. They are at the outside, uh, on the outskirts of, uh, of the experiment. 
So, um, Andre, there are many, many questions. So if you... I'll join you I, in the control room. Yes, it will be nice to, to try to tackle some of these questions uh, together because um, what I'm trying to think of is how to address multiple of them at the same time. And I feel like there are several questions about really specifically the kind of physics that we're trying, we're looking for or we're testing, right? And uh, I would generally say that at the LHC, we, of course, collect all this data and we spend a lot of effort in analyzing this data. And there's many details here about the distribution of the data, for example, that we can talk about if people are curious. But uh, generally speaking, the way we analyze this data is, again, we have this sort of prediction versus the observation. But we have what we call searches for new physics, right? And this means we try to discover a new particle. And this may be a particle that's expected or a particle that's unexpected. It sort of depends on how you look at this. So you may have uh, you know, certain models, certain what I would call extensions or um, let's say, oh, these are what we call extensions to the standard model. And these are things you might have heard of like supersymmetry. Somebody mentioned in the questions uh, um, extra dimensions. So these are, Mo you know, uh, different uh, models or descriptions that may have, as a consequence, a new particle that we might be able to observe. And these are what I would call searches. We're searching for, let's say, new physics. But there are, we, we can also say that we have precision measurements. And these uh, are where we have a very detailed, very specific prediction that our best model says, OK, we should see this many of these particles that do this kind of thing. And that means they should have this momentum. They should have this sort of uh, separation between the particles, this kind of charge, that sort of thing. And we go out and see how many of these events, as we call them, we find. And when things agree, we say the model is accurate. But if there's even a slight disagreement, then we might say, well, maybe we can modify the model slightly by introducing some new interaction or something like that. So these, um, these sort of approaches or um, methods are complementary, I would say. Uh, but yes, there's many more specific things we can look for, many different models uh, that might have very specific predictions. And we might look for dark matter, for example. Mm. And that's a very interesting, uh, you know, the method methodology of how we go about finding a particle that would be invisible in our detector would is, is interesting in itself. No, if you want to. No, so I, I sorry, I just I, I now have the QA in front of me. So um there's only like a hundred questions that we haven't uh oh well we we answered more than a half of them. Yes. <laughs> well of course uh sorry about for those uh, who, who who we couldn't answer. We tried to answer however in in speech so yes. probably yeah, there's uh, yeah probably some... most of them are already answered as well so mm -hmm. so regarding regarding the notion of uh, there there are, there are two types of exploration we do here one of them is let's say theory guided so um i mean andres and i are experimentalists and zoltan and noemi me too yeah um so <laughs> our our let's say at least the way I see it, our core business is to build the detectors and see what happens in these collisions and expect the unexpected. When we go and look at the data and when we design the algorithms to say which things are worth keeping and looking more carefully at and which things should just be uh, thrown out because we cannot save them all, we do have some theoretical guidance, but we also have a lot of, we just keep it and we'll see if there's something else out there. So one of, uh, you know, Andres was mentioning the, this uh, theory and we have very, very, very precise uh, precision uh, predictions from this theory. The problem is that this theory does not talk about gravity, has nothing on dark matter, has nothing on dark energy. And it's a pretty poor theory in a way. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. It has not, we have not been able to break it since the 1960s. So for the last 60 years, uh, we've been at it 
and we find what this theory predicts. But we know that it's not a very nice theory of the rest of nature. I mean, it predicts these particles. And I saw a question in there, which is like, how often do you find a new particle? That's an interesting question. So not very often uh, and all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so not very often because it's, it's rare that uh, we can find a new constituent of matter. So we, there are like, uh, uh, how many are there? Three, six, nine, 12, plus- Depends on how you count, so like 26 by- Yeah, if depends. you take into account the color, it, yeah, it's yeah. complicated. But there's like, you know, you, you can put in your fingers and your toes and perhaps a friend's hand and you have them all. And these we do not find every day. This, on the other hand, there's something we do find more often. And I think there were like, 20 or so new particles that we found at, at CERN with the, the LHC. And these correspond to, let's say, arrangements of quarks. So quarks are an elementary particle, but when you bring them together by groups of two or three, and now four or five, uh, we found new arrangements of uh, these particles in what we call hadrons. Yeah, so and that was a question if we have like arrangements of four or five quarks. Yeah, and uh, we there was a big in the beginning of this century that there were like you know the big pent and then it was a bit of a fluke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but now there's very good evidence that these things do exist. Uh, unfortunately, we have not really found blue balls yet, which would be another cool thing. So maybe I can uh, phrase this as there are when we most of the time when we discover a new particle, uh, most of these are sort of expected. And these are simply, they haven't been documented before. We haven't been able to conclusively say, okay, we've observed it. So another way to put it is it's, it's very, I think we haven't been stumped and surprised about a new discovery in a long time. One of the examples I can think of is the muon who ordered that. But um, our models have been getting very good and the standard <laughs> model has been in development. I mean, it's a standard model is just a collection of uh, different or not even different theories, but it has been um, started as quantum mechanics and then you added special relativity yeah. and then, then that became quantum field theory. So at this point, it's a very elaborate theory and it's very successful. As another thing that I would like to mention is that we haven't been able to break that, break that theory, mm -hmm. but that's what we wanna do. We want to break it in the sense that we wanna find if there's any flaws or, uh, if there's anything inaccurate about it so that we can improve that model, yeah, that right. description, that's really the goal uh, that motivates most yeah, of yeah. us. So in a way, theories are not reality. Reality is reality. And we make measurements about nature and you know what's out there. Theories and models are ways of trying to describe that. Yeah. And the standard model is really good, but you know, no dark matter, so it's useless. Right. So one thing like, okay, to take this to the extreme, Nowadays, if you ask most people, what, what's the universe? They'll say, well, okay, we think electrons and protons, and then there's these muons sometimes here and there. Um, and we, if you ask a theorist, he might talk about fundamental quantum fields instead of the individual particles. Mm -hmm. But part of my point is that 100 years from now, uh, or I don't know, some later, much later in the future, we might talk about something completely different. We might say electrons are not a good model anymore. We might come up with a better model and say, we think the universe is this other thing. And that's what we're trying to do. If you think in the past, we had these models of the atom and we thought they were these things with the orbits. Now, nowadays, we think it's a little bit different than that. Fuzzy. Or they're fuzzy or something. So that's really what we're uh, trying to that that's what drives us right mm -hmm. to make these more accurate exactly descriptions the model is different from the speculation because the model can predict mm -hmm. uh, a, a result of an experiment and this is the experiment that we are doing exactly and that's that's how we can can tell whether a model is a good model that it describes the nature at that level that we want, or the model is to be discarded. Yes, that's, that's a very important thing. That science, the science uh, should always make predictions 
scientific models that you can check. Right. So that's 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 one. I mean, my friends always tell me that's so negative, Andre. I mean, you always want to disprove <laughs> things. You want to show that they are wrong, but and it's it's interesting because it's it's like a winnowing process. You know, you want to uh, separate the the you know the grain from the husk, and you want to throw away the husk. So you need to blow you need to blow on it. Um, but it is indeed a process of separation, and mm -hmm. and so if a theory comes up and says, oh, I predict that you can see green goblins under your mattress. And you know, you go and you lift your mattress and you don't see green goblins, then you know the, the theory is wrong. And you move on to the next best theory, which is probably there are no green goblins or goblins at all. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, I mean, I see that, wow, there's really, they keep coming. Oh, this is a brilliant one. How long, this is from Justin. How long does the process take from proposing an experiment to being able to actually test it with the LHC? So th there are two ways of thinking about this. One of them is if you want to do, if you want to really create and build a completely new experiment, and it's possible, there were people, uh, what's the name of this beautiful experiment we have in one of our tunnels? It's uh, not solid, it's metal. Oh, yeah, or the model. It's metal, model. Yeah. Ah, model. And yeah. phaser, phaser also. Mm -hmm. yeah, phaser. So, an SMD, which is the one that uh, is being, yeah. So what you can do is if you and, uh, you know, your buddies have an idea, but okay, this, this, I, I'm, I'm simplifying it. You have to write something which is called a expression of uh, intent, basically saying, oh, we would like to test this. And then this goes to a scientific uh, committee. And then if the scientific committee says, oh, okay, that makes sense. Then you can do a letter of intent. Uh, with a bit more detail saying who are the people. And then if the scientific committee says, all right, that sounds fine. Now, please go and uh, study it more in more detail. Then you make something which is called a conceptual design report. And this is usually a big document. And it will even say- the, Even the document before the letter of intent is, is already an extensive document. Um, so, yes. so, so but that, it's, requires, it's so, that requires so, lots of work. But the and the, simulations and simulations before yeah. you submit it so it is not just uh, you you think of it during sunday afternoon right this is this this requires by then a huge work and then what comes yeah so then you have the conceptual design report where you say these are the pieces we think we are going to build them like this or like that these are the parties that will be involved and the funding will be coming from these sources and then if the committee uh, thinks that that makes sense, you know, typically the committee is going to try and poke holes, like how exactly do you think about building this? How exactly are you going to do that? There's a lot of simulation and, you know, we were talking about this earlier, all of these programs that we run to simulate interactions in the detectors, you do that, you check, you know, does the detector do what I think it should do? And then comes the technical design report. And this one, you really go into the detail of how exactly you're going to construct every single piece. By this time, more than 100 people work on, usually. Well, but maybe not in the SMB, but... Then there is another way of doing things, which is, for instance, you just go to an institute that is participating in one of the experiments. And this also addresses another question that was asked, which was, how many times do you repeat your experiment? And that's the beauty of a collider, is that every time a pair of protons collides, it's in a sense, a new experiment. So every time you collide the protons, you have a random happenstance of an interaction in nature. And sometimes it might produce a Higgs, sometimes it might produce, I don't know, three pions, 15 pions, 16 pions. I would be here a million times talking about pions until the next Higgs comes around. Um, so if you have a certain theory you want to test, and this happens in many places that there is a physics department where a theorist has what we call an exotic model, because there are many exotic models. Um, you don't, they just go to their experimental, experimental colleagues and they say, well, I have this model. And then they can test it with the data that is coming out of these uh, experiments. So these are two very different ways of how can you do your own experiments. Uh, you can come and do some measurements which basically use all of these collisions, which are each collision a different experiment. So kind of adding a bit more about sort of, because like you can propose, you can interpret that question as, as an experiment could be a new search, a new analysis. Yeah, exactly. And that's also very interesting. In fact, it could you could even go deeper, but okay, like there's also the analysis side of things. 
and uh, how you propose a new analysis and you pursue it and you get people interested and invested in that. But also very interesting is from the, the point of view of trigger, right? Because if you have a compelling enough case, you might convince people, let's dedicate, you know, what we're doing with the trigger is it's the filter, right? And we have these interactions and we have to select the ones that we think are more interesting. But that's a, that sounds like a very subjective statement and it is, right? You have to they have a collaboration and they all have to agree on what kind of events do we wanna focus on? Which one do we wanna collect the most of? And these can be things that look like the Higgs because the Higgs is the new, the new toy that we have, the new yeah. thing that we can probe. And it might talk to dark matter. It might talk to particles yeah. we've never seen before. Exactly, but then somebody might come along and say, well, what if there was this kind of interaction and it produced this kind of thing that we're not looking at? And this could be as a very, I don't know what example just, just comes to my mind is long lived particles. Mm -hmm. So we're now looking for events where we have this interaction, but this particle sort of sneaks away and moves uh, you know, to a different part of the detector sort of flies out and then it decays. So we don't see it for a while and then we see it sort of explode or decay somewhere else in the detector. And this could be even, uh, you know, we, we are even considering putting detectors on the surface of CMS, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, so the particle may travel quite a long time and then decay. Uh, and these are the sort of things that, you know, people are constantly trying to come up with, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I don't know, that's a, maybe just gives you an idea of uh, from the, the possibilities. Yeah. There's, there's a really good question here from uh, Jay and Malaki. Mm -hmm. uh, are the experiments sensitive to seismic waves? Yes. Well, I mean, yeah, so that's, seismic activity. Yeah, so the, the experiments themselves, not a lot, but if you think about the accelerator, these 27 kilometers of accelerator, if the earth wobbles and vibrates, the accelerator can actually see that because you need to shoot. I mean, to get the two beams to hit each other, it's like shooting an arrow from Ireland and an arrow from the US and have the two hit each other over the ocean. So that's the kind of precision. And in fact, one of the accelerators that we had before the LHC in the same tunnel, which was the large electron positron collider, uh, if I remember correctly, the main effects that they were sensitive to were the tidal effects of uh, the moon. So the, the ring becomes smaller or bigger depending on where the moon is, on where the sun is, and what is the level of water in Lake Geneva? Because that puts more pressure or less pressure uh, onto the ground. So the accelerator is incredibly sensitive. Uh, and there was once a earthquake, I think it was in uh, Chile or Peru. I don't remember exactly, it was in South America. And you could see in the logbook uh, of the accelerator, wobbling you know that there was something that happened and mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the the accelerator beams the beams just went a bit uh, left and right so you can even say that uh, the moon even can have an impact yeah. because the moon uh, can influence the tides it can also influence the soil well, so because we are big yes exactly. so that's that's the that's the yeah, it's the like a big lever arm i wow. like this question about uh, how do we celebrate a new discovery and, and just the general ooh, culture inside. Ooh, 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 ooh. The so, the, which culture? There are so many cultures. That's kind of what I mean. Yeah, that's what it makes me think of. So do you celebrate? Um, so there are, there are, I think there are several answers. So we try to, to celebrate every small victory, like when things work, somebody opens a bottle of something. Mm -hmm. When we collect a given amount of data, we open Yes. Yeah. When the accelerator gives beams and collisions, we bring them a bottle for yes. uh, good services. Like but this is not the discovery. No. no, so the discovery is a very long process, and you don't know if you you don't know when you are at the end of the discovery, That's unless a... we are talking about the 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 two talks of the two experiment spokespersons. I mean, but that's a good point. That that's a good point. So there's a threshold of beyond which you know that there's something new. So mm -hmm. for me, as a CMS person, it was when I saw the Atlas talk. And I could see, oh, they see more or less the same thing as we do. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we are not completely wrong. And that's another good point about uh, like kind of going back to the relationship between the experiments, the mm -hmm. collaborations. So uh, I don't know if, I, I, sorry, I don't recall if you actually mentioned it, but like 
a big part of having these two collaborations work on sort of similar stuff, but very independently is to corroborate, right? To, yeah. to check it, each other's results. But we do not share information no, no, on we the do analysis. Not. That's a very important thing. We do not want to yeah. bias each other. So independent is the key word. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So we can also maybe say- Yeah, a, so a, then the thing about the culture at CERN. Yeah. So CERN is a, is a place where before the pandemic, there used to be the summer student Israelo-Palestinian party. It's a place where you have uh, Indian and uh, Pakistani working together, Chinese and Taiwanese in the same project. It's it, and I, I think that in in this day and age, uh, these things are it, they are rather interesting. When you do, I, like you stop to think about what that means, uh, uh, when you look at the world news, it's it's really fantastic. Now, the culture at CERN is typically. All questions are good questions. Uh, interrupting to ask a question is not a problem. Uh, a PhD student may ask a question from a very senior researcher and that's not an issue. Um, it's very open, it's very flat and it takes many things from all the people here. I mean, so Andres is from Puerto Rico, I'm from Portugal, Zoltan is from uh, Hungary. Hungary. Uh, we have Italians, French, uh, Spanish, oh dear. Um, In this Brits. room at this moment, we are five from four different countries. Mm -hmm. I think at CMS, there's like 50 countries that are part of the club. What? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't, didn't count in the... Yeah. the other part of the room. So this is... But it, it, it's also, yeah. it's also many, many people, right? So like, uh, it, it, that, this is not to say that there's this many people here at CERN, and it's not to say that these people are employed by CERN, but there are maybe 15 to 20,000 people that are involved with mm -hmm. CERN in some way, with some collaboration. Just our collaboration alone is about 5,000, more than 5,000 people that are active in some capacity. And these aren't just physicists. There are yeah, thousands of physicists, but there's also thousands of engineers mm -hmm. uh, and many, many, many students. Um, so there's not just a variety in the cultures and, and the background of people, but I guess that also in their academic background or stages yeah, in their the professional yeah. interests. So Andre, this is a question for you. What sort of music do you listen to while you're working? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know, I'm wearing this, this band's t-shirt. It's the contortionist. This is like a progressive metal band, mm. uh, but Anything, I mean, personally, I, I listen to anything from, yeah, metal to jazz. Andres, Andres plays music. Yes. I he does guitar. not just listen, he does not just consume, he also produces. Yeah. In fact, we have a show coming up uh, <laughs> next uh, Wednesday. So if any one of you guys is around in the Geneva area, you should check out our band's next show. What is it? So it's the, it's actually a band, it's called the Haneke Twins, and it's all certain people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, there's and electronics we're... engineers in there. Yep. It's it's an interesting yeah. mix. So I know one, one of the things that, so I listen to a lot of music. I like to listen to music while I work. And one of the things I've been amazed is that there are people who cannot operate if there is music in the background. I'm kind yeah. of the opposite. Yes, so, <laughs> which which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, are there any dangers when working there for Petsar? This is a very good question. Yeah. We, we had similar questions in the past. The CERN, you can regard CERN as, a, as an industrial environment with its dangers. Uh, so you, you saw forklifters, you saw lifting devices, you saw big structures. Of course, they have their own uh, danger to the workers. We all have to, to keep it in mind. Also at CERN, uh, we, we monitor the radiation. This is a very important thing. We all have who, who is, is allowed to go underground. We all have those kind of things that Andre is just, just showing. Uh, this is a dosimeter. So, so we have to read it out. Uh, that's a different story, I will tell. <laughs> so the dosimeter is to be read out regularly. It is evaluated once a year, at least a part of it. Yeah. And, uh, and then we get the, the report on the, the radiation level that we got. Uh, we don't get more. Actually, the, the, the standards 
of the radiation levels that are allowed is the same here as in as for the grand public in Europe. Yeah. So we are not we are not guinea pigs and uh, get more radiation. No, we we can't get more radiation, but at least it is checked. Yeah, and so so just just to put it in context, I have been exposed to more radiation in intercontinental flights because as you go up, you don't have the atmosphere to shield you from particles entering the atmosphere than in my whole work uh, at CERN. So exactly. You, you, yeah. These devices are so sensitive that if you take them for a transatlantic flight, yeah. they would tell. Yes, that's how, yeah. that's why I know, fact, because I forgot it in my briefcase. <laughs> yeah, and, and if they go through the x-ray machine at the airport, it's also a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but in terms of dangers, I think what Zoltan was saying is important. CERN is not, it's not a museum. And it's not an office, it's not just offices. There are laboratories. So you have electrical dangers, you have uh, cryogenic dangers. And the thing is that there's all the training and all the material needed uh, to actually work safely in those environments. Oh, how many people that work at CERN are autistic? I don't know if we have uh, statistics on that, also because that would probably breach uh, the people's uh, rights to their own uh, privacy and also the autism is a spectrum yes thing. so right. so, so there are there are some very very light things yep. i guess so um, the thing is that so what i can say is that geeks and nerds at cern are abundant like what is the square root of two <laughs> 1.424 there you go and one over square root of two uh one over square root of two I don't know this by heart. Okay, fine. Zero seven, zero seven, one seven. <laughs> so, uh, Zoltan, digit of pi. Huh. Uh, one, uh, three point one four, uh, one five nine two six seven, five three six five, five eight nine seven nine six. Eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, I used to, I used to know two hundred <laughs> digits of pi. I, wow. Yeah. I only go up to I'm, eight, I'm nine, probably seven, too old to bother myself with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> so there's a lot of geeks and nerds around here uh, of all, all kinds, all, all kinds, really. Ge computing geeks, math geeks, you know, material science geeks. All probably, right. probably to do this work, you have to be a little bit more of a geek. Uh -huh. Well, you have to. Um, so, so we have a we profile of this work is a bit different from a regular work. When you go to the office uh, early in the morning at 8.30 and you leave the office together with all its problems at uh, 5.30, we, we, we take the problem home yeah. and we, we think of it. Uh, uh, well, maybe another way to put this is, yeah, I, I would say there's many, many different personalities at CERN. And again, many different backgrounds, but one of the things that I think most of the people here have in common is, is there's a passion, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just I mean, people are, it's not just that people are driven to work hard. People, people don't work hard because they're trying to impress anybody. They work hard because they're just really passionate about the, the research that we do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's why we're here on a Saturday, just hanging out at CMS. and. <laughs> Um, you see examples of that all the time. People yeah, yeah. are just willing to, and, and not just willing, but they're happy to spend a lot of their time, most of their time on the research. Yeah, it's, it's not just a job for in most cases, it's also a calling, that's, uh, that's right. So I think we've, it, did, I, did I get this right? We've been on for almost two hours now. And uh, I wonder, where are we on the questions? Oh, there are only 132 to go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. Ah, there, sorry, Delia, go. Yes, I want to highlight uh, some questions about um, the number of women. Yeah, I, in... I just saw that one, the ratio yes. of women to men and other genders. So we Most just had... Most feminists um, We just had this week, there was the LGBTQ uh, day in STEM and... Uh, there, there are a lot of LGBTQ people in the community. Um, I, I, I don't know. They do not necessarily announce themselves. So I don't know if there are statistics. As regards um, women and men, um, there's a big discussion going on uh, that uh, goes back 
to the fact that there aren't many women taking on uh, science and engineering uh, studies, uh, especially in higher education. So it's kind of hard to, um, you know, you already start, when you start with a pool uh, that has a certain uh, ratio, it's, it's hard to, to change that unless you start doing something very uh, skewed. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think that overall at CERN, it's, there's 20% uh, women. And uh, the idea, there is an aspiration to bring this number up to 25% by 2025. This was uh, something that was announced uh, not too long ago. So CERN is aware that this is an issue in society. Yeah. So let's 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 also make sure that we can distinguish two things. There's only so much CERN can do because CERN does not employ 15,000 people. So CERN employs about 2,500, and then there is a user community or you know people who come from who are employed by uh, a lot of labs uh, who are here or who are back in their home countries, and that's like the 12,000. That's the bulk. So CERN is like uh, providing the services, right? We we we. We clean the streets and we build the accelerators, and then you know people from all over the world, uh, they come and build the detectors and do the experiments. And of course, over those communities, uh, CERN does not really have any control. I mean, uh, we're not going to say, ah, no, 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 you can only register people of this gender or that gender. Uh, so it's, it, you really have to take this um, carefully because it's not uh, one single homogeneous uh, reality. But we of course we of course can advertise science and try to oh yeah bring and we do younger people and that's what we, i mean that's kind of what we're doing now even i mean any kind of outreach hopefully will mm -hmm. get people interested if you're a girl you can do science if you're a girl you can do engineering we often and participate in the girls in science yes. programs and yeah. as i understand it there's many parents uh that are watching us hopefully and ho maybe we can you know uh get parents enthusiastic about science and that can then uh lead to enthusiasm uh you know get the parents to you know push the, their children uh, and mm. motivate them to go into science as well Deli, do you have other questions that you saw that jumped at you uh a lot of people want to know about black holes and cern the yes. truth now Give us the truth. The truth. <laughs> the truth. Uh, the truth is uh, there's a website. Is uh, as the LHC destroyed destroyed the earth. The earth .com? Yet. Yet. .com? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And it just says no. Well, well but it's a measurement, right? It's a measurement. Me, yeah. For me, the the best evidence is that uh, my car is still parked in the parking lot over there. You probably remember that was yes. a YouTube video the that GIF. the parking lot yes. just outside here <laughs> uh, goes in, and uh, my car is still there. Okay, um, that's very important. So the truth now. So I think that there is a very good um, Comedy Central, uh, the Daily Show with uh, it was the Daily Show with John Stewart and John Oliver came to CERN, and he actually then went back to the U.S. and sat with the person who sued CERN in a U.S. court in Hawaii, and this person when asked. So what are the chances for the LHC to end the, the world? His answer was 50-50, because it either does or it doesn't. Yeah, things either happen or they don't. Uh, yeah, exactly. Or they don't. I so think the, the reality is a little bit more complicated. Right, so right. One, one of the main arguments as to why the LHC is not going to end the, the universe as we know it, is that the kind of collisions that we are doing here is nothing compared with the violence, with the amount of energy available in collisions that happen all the time out there in the universe. And that are impacting the Earth all yeah, the time. Yeah, as well. Exactly, the upper atmosphere. So if these collisions out there in the universe have not made you know, planets disappear and neutron stars disappear and you know, wreaked havoc all over the place, these ones also can't quite do it. I'm sorry, I mean, I wish to some extent that we could manipulate gravity in the lab at the quantum level and see it, we've looked and we haven't found that yet. Exactly. However, I mean, it, it should be clear that there are serious uh, searches, serious studies uh, where we're testing this, right? Can microscopic black holes be, be produced? Yeah. Uh, but these are different yeah. in the sense that 
the, the smaller the, the black hole, the, the faster it evaporates. Right. So it means that these black holes would evaporate before they would reach the, the, the beam pipe, eat it up completely, and then the detector and my car in the parking lot. Yeah. Uh, and all of the all of the theories agree on this. That we black holes evaporate. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so these are so these are uh, when you go when you go to the when you go to the uh, when you're talking about producing black holes by a quantum in quantum field theory, let's say, if you have something, if the particles can go into a black hole, then the black hole can decay into particles. Otherwise, it just does not work. And the evaporation, the evaporation has to do with that. You can create these objects, and then evaporating just means that they will decay like particles would decay. And in fact, I remember back in 2010, we were looking for these events because if, if these black holes would be produced, these microscopic black holes, you would get events that would produce like lots of particles all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so it would be really spectacular to see those things. And we looked and we didn't find anything. Exactly. So, uh, by oh, the way, oh. one, more, one more thing I wanted to, to add to this. Uh, just adding to that, that you said that, that we didn't see uh, planets disappearing, etc. Uh, that is another very important evidence that we are here and talking about. During the past 4.2 billion years, we got so many uh, uh, particles from the universe and even the very high, very energetic ones mm -hmm. to the upper atmosphere that if it would have, if it could happen, that it creates a black hole that. Uh, that is not a, a, a micro black hole that we talked about, mm -hmm. but, but really a dangerous one. That would have already. We would not be having this conversation. Exactly, exactly. So having this conversation is the the evidence that this doesn't happen. All right. So I'm going to try and take like three in a row. The CERN effect, the land above it. No, and actually people are very happy that CERN is down there, so that you know they don't have to get roads uh, all screwed up. Is it fun to work at CERN? I mean, if you ask as it is, obviously, <laughs> otherwise we would not be here doing this. Um, and then there was a question about, are there opportunities for work experience or internships for 17 or 18 year olds? Um, yes, I think there are. There are actually uh, people who organize high school student uh, internships at CERN. There's theme line at CERN, for example. Mm -hmm. That one is a competition, so you can uh, make a project and submit it, and then you can come and uh, actually put uh, your detector on a beam line mm -hmm. under supervision. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was another, is there a requirement to be bilingual? How do you deal with language barriers? So that's a good question. So CERN, the organization itself, uh, is, uh, has two official languages, English and uh, French. Um, my experience is that whenever you discuss data analysis, everything happens in English. If you then want to get a crane or if you want to get something done that requires heavy manipulation, French is very useful. And because the, the, the technicians are more or less- Yes, there's a lot of uh, French from the From the area, yeah. that's, a, that's a French. And then one thing I've learned in CMS is that Italian, I mean, Italian is just a delight to try and speak. I mean, I don't speak very good Italian, but it tastes good in your mouth. <laughs> and speaking in Italian is, is, is just oh, amazing. One of the best languages in the world. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's also- That's the Italian easy, behind. Very, no Spanish in Italian, no French in Yes, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and Italian are all more or less the same, I agree. Lucky you. <laughs> Lucky kind of you, the, the Hungarian is not part of this, this club. Delia, <laughs> do you have more questions for us that you've, that you've picked up on? We don't hear you. You are, you muted. are muted. Uh, no, no more questions right. that I... So then I would suggest that uh, after 120 minutes, um, we wind down. Uh, thank you very much, Andres. Thank you, Zoltan. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Noemi. Thanks, Noemi. Uh, Noemi is now relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm listening. Yes, thank you. Thank you for helping me not bump into things and uh, bang my head downstairs. Actually, that's part of the, the safety. Yes, things. you don't we... go, not one person, you always have two people. Exactly. exactly. And um, what can I say? Uh, stay sharp, stay interested.
and ask questions. I mean, those of you who know of the Facebook group, you know, you can go and post your questions there as well. And uh, I'll try in the coming weeks to address them. Mm -hmm. Right, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Much. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. See ya.